back to the O Show, everything crypto and NFTs every day, and also everything XRP, Ripple. I have got Jeremy Hogan. He is a super fancy, amazing attorney, and we're going to be talking about the Ripple versus SEC case in the United States because it is coming to an end, I think. That's at least what you told me when you first got on. But before we get into it, Jeremy, can you please just go ahead and tell the audience who you are and why they should listen to what you have to say? My name is Jeremy Hogan. I'm the partner at Hogan & Hogan. We're a general practice law firm. And for the last couple of years, I've been representing and giving advice to small crypto projects on the side as kind of a passion project. So thanks for the introduction. I've never been called fancy before, though. That's a first. Thank you. I actually really, I have, so I've got a legal series on this show and we talk, I talk to different attorneys from different backgrounds. And the reason why is because I do view you guys kind of as the experts in the space, because you know what's happening with regulation. And if you know what's happening with regulation, you're able to give your clients guidance on how they need to operate their companies. And it could be a change in tokenomics. It could be a change in how they distribute funds, how they market, how they develop their target audience, those types of things. And I don't think we give you guys a lot of enough credit, but we should because you guys kind of have the little bit of insight as to what's going on. And I like to critical think on this show and I like to have, and, um, invite the audience to do so. Because if we're not able to use critical thinking, then we're going to make poor investing decisions. If we use critical thinking, we follow the money and we follow the facts, we can make better investing decisions. Well said. See, all right. So I'm going to let you talk to us about this case because I wasn't a big XRP fan or Ripple fan. And then when I found out they were fighting against the SEC, I started, they grew on me. The XRP community grew on me because I think that the Rip, I think that Ripple actually has enough guts to stand up to these oppressive third parties. And I'm very, very happy to see it because nobody else in crypto is. So talk to us about what ha what's happening and what we can expect. Sure. So we've reached the point of the case where we call it the beginning of the end. The judge is requiring that summary judgment briefs be filed. I believe it's going to be November 15 will be the final filings in the case probably. And then it will be up to the judge to make a decision. I've kind of pinpointed late December, maybe into January. Uh, another attorney that's a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Filan, he's pinpointed February or March as possible end dates. So we kind of have bookended it from sometime between no, no, uh, December this year and March of next year will be the end of the case. This case is not going to trial, Wendy. This is going to be decided by the judge. Oh, and okay. uh, because there's not really an issue of fact to be tried to a jury. So really, this is an issue of law. So they're going to present all the facts to her in what are called summary judgment briefs. And the judge will take a look at those and make a decision just based upon what's in the paper. There won't be any live witness testimony or anything like that. So we're at the, the beginning of the end. There's a couple of really interesting things going on right now in the case. Um, the first one is the Hinman emails, which I know you were talking to John Deaton a couple of months ago, and he I think he mentioned those. It's super interesting because the these are about 68 emails that a man uh, at the SEC named Mr. Hinman put sent out and he got feedback from other attorneys at the SEC about a speech that he was giving back in 2018. This fight has been going on in this court for over a year, whether the SEC has to disclose those emails. And it's almost unprecedented. I mean, I've been practicing law for 20 years and I'm in court. Um, I know I don't just do, you know, consultation. I'm, I'm literally in court almost, you know, every week, if not every month. So um, I've never seen this happen before where a, where a plaintiff or really the prosecution in this case, the SEC has fought so hard to keep the defendant, the Ripple, from seeing documents. And that's really what it is. They fought for the last year to do it. And it's really unprecedented because even though the judge has told them like three times at this point, you have to give these emails to Ripple, they keep moving for reconsideration. They keep appealing her order. And now we're finally at the point where the first judge is going to finally make a final ruling on whether they have to dispose those emails. And then it's going to, they have already, and SEC has already said they're going to appeal it to the uh, second judge and maybe even appeal it up to the circuit court. So we're not sure how that's going to play out, but it's really strange that they're fighting so hard to keep these emails from being seen by Ripple. And so, of course, that leads to people like myself and others to speculate what's in those emails that. The SEC doesn't want Ripple to see. And we've kind of come to kind of a conclusion, although it's all speculation, that it's something in those emails that basically says XRP is not a security or maybe 
something ambiguous saying, well, we don't know if it's a security or not, and it's still up in the air. And so we think, and I think this is actually Beaton's uh, proposition, is that if those emails have to be given uh, over to Ripple, that that will lead to a settlement of the case because there's something in those emails the SEC does not want Ripple to see. Okay. Very interesting. That's a lot of information. I'm trying to process that because we didn't chat about this before because I like to do everything right. organic. No, it's good. It's good because every, because I do like, I taught myself how to read um, court documents. I taught myself how to read, um, how to do contract law because I I needed to do it. So now I took that, that self-education. Of course you take business law in college, like everybody does, but I taught myself to use that education or that information to go through SEC documents and stuff for preparation on the show. And it is very interesting that they're not like, it, it, cause it sounds like, even from being a person that watches and monitors, if you don't want, if you're fighting so hard to not show something, it means there's generally something that's there. So it's, it's that part is interesting. So you don't think, you think that the judge is going to decide, you don't think it's going to go to a jury. You don't, you know, you don't think it's going to go past um, December or March of 2023. Was that correct? Correct. And there could be parts of the case that move forward to a jury trial. What the SEC did was was really also a little unprecedented with the Ripple case, especially is they, they sued Ripple, but they also sued two of the executives, uh, Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson, individually. Now, those cases are a little bit different because with Ripple, you're only arguing whether XRP is a security or not. Now, with the cases against the individual defendants, you have to prove and the SEC has to prove that they knew that what they were doing was wrong to make it short. So. Uh, that is a little bit different. That might go to a jury trial, but the case against Ripple, I think, ends with the judge making a decision later on this year or early uh, 2023. Okay, fair enough. All right. So those will those individual cases impact the dis, impact the, the bigger picture, and that's Ripple versus the SEC? It won't, it won't impact it directly, but what we've been seeing in this litigation is also pretty interesting. Um, have you ever heard of overcharging on a case? Like if you're arrested uh, for DUI and they tried to charge you with something even worse than DUI, let's say you're driving and they charge you with DUI, but they also charge you with manslaughter on, or, or attempted manslaughter because maybe they, you know, even though you didn't hurt anyone, it's called yeah. overcharging. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the SEC did here in, in bringing in the individual, individual defendants. What ended up happening is they opened up all these different avenues for Ripple to get more documents and more information from them because now it's not only about Ripple, but it's about these individual defendants and what they knew or should have known. And so it seems to me it was a mistake to do that. I think it was overcharging and I think that was a mistake. It sounds like they underestimated um, the amount of money that Ripple has and the amount of money those two individuals have. And it also seems that they underestimated how strong the um, Ripple community is and the XRP community is. And it also seems like they thought that um, Ripple was going to bend the knee like everybody else in crypto has. But the the difference between Ripple and some of these other companies is that they have money and money talks and money makes people listen. So I think that that was the SEC's biggest mistake is this probably could have been handled behind closed doors. And it's just, it's very, the whole entire thing is kind of mind boggling and it's hard for me because we see all of this innovation coming out of other countries and we see some sort of gray area, like in Southeast Asia and whatnot with crypto, you know, there's, it's very, it seems to be more friendly for people to go and to build crypto projects because they're a little bit more lenient. And there's like, you know, it's, it's not like the U S because the United States is kind of Kick, is kicking themselves right now, I think, because we we're in this we're in a recession. We have all this bad economic turmoil, turmoil happening. I believe cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, like all like blockchain, NFTs, whatever. I feel like it's a massive opportunity to generate jobs, to generate revenue, especially with taxpayer dollars. And I feel like the SEC is being so strict and being kind of so thick headed that they are not witnessing that. Hey, why don't we put out some sort of gray area? Like, obviously we can't have like real scam artists, you know, building here, but let's put out some gray area. Let's make these people take um, pay taxes. Let's get people back to work. Let's do all of these things. And let's also be the best country that we can be. But instead of doing that, they're picking this fight with Ripple. They're picking this fight with American with Americans. And they're picking this fight against this industry that's going to make waves regardless. They're good. Crypto and Bitcoin's not going anywhere. So to me, it seems counterproductive. And another thing that bothers me is we have all of this, these issues with DeFi, like with all these exchanges becoming insolvent with Fierro's capital. And I really felt like 
like the SEC is coming out and mad about stable coins now. Okay, fine. But they had since like we saw the 2017 boom and then we saw the bear market. I felt like they had all these years and they had all this time to come out with something instead of wasting people's time and energy and money. Cause that's what's happening is they're literally wasting all of this to fight with Ripple when they can say, you know what? Cryptocurrency is not a security. We're going to classify it as something brand new. This is how you're going to get taxed. This is how you can build. If you're going to do X, Y, and Z, you need to report to us. That's my personal opinion. On well, it. listen, I mean, the SEC is an agency of the federal government. And the one thing that we know and I know about an agency of the federal government is it's all about power and maintaining it. What the SEC is doing is they're applying a law from 80 years ago to a new emerging technology. And it's different than anything that's happened in the past. Because in the past, what you would do is what? You would, you would build the cars and then the government would build the road and you would sell the cars. Now, I mean, in the crypto world, what, what do you do? You build the roads first mm -hmm. and then you put the and then you build the cars. So it's backwards. And they're trying to apply this old fashioned mindset to this new asset class. And it's just not working. But if the SEC was to uh, change its rules or to put it in, put crypto into a separate, you know, uh, a separate bin, shall we say, for for regulatory purposes, it would limit its control and it would limit its power. And that's what it all um, comes down to is the SEC wants to control this new asset class and it wants to control it under the regime that's been built up for the last 80 years. And for them to change that would mean giving up some of that power. And, you know, with the new talk about new legislation, there's already some, uh, you know, if you look at the new legislation that was proposed recently, really what they're talking about is giving the uh, Commodity Commission a lot more power over crypto. And uh, so, you know, the SEC is, is getting kind of put into this tough spot where, you know, either they're going to do it themselves or it's going to be done to them. But, you know, for an agency of the, of the federal government to say, we're going to relinquish some control over an asset class, you know, it, it just never happens. It just doesn't happen. I don't know why, but it's, it's all about control. Yeah, I, I understand that. I just, for me, I just, I rack my brain. Like, I know it's about control. I know what they want, but it's like, I just see the amount, I, I just see the opportunity. And again, you guys, I don't like paying taxes. I pay my taxes because I'm not going to jail over something stupid, but I just don't understand why they're taking, like, this is a great opportunity to make money, like to tax the heck out of people, especially with a really big industry. Like there's so much money to be made, but as far as bringing it back, cause I can go off about this all day, but bringing it back really to the, the ripple, you know, ripple versus sec, is this going, like, is the outcome going to change crypto? Like, is it going to change it as far as is crypto a security? Like, are they going to come out and just say XRP is a security? And then will that cause a waterfall effect and make every single other cryptocurrency a security besides Bitcoin? Yes. So look, I mean, I'm looking at, let me just pull it up real fast. I'm looking at crypto uh, coin market or the one that has the top cryptos by market cap, right? Yeah. Coin market cap or coin gecko. Yeah. So I'm on coin market cap and Bitcoin, of course, number one. Now, going down through one to 10. And I've done this in a video before where I've looked at each project and kind of looked into its background and I gave it like a SEC danger rating to see what the, the danger there is from the SEC. You should have a website um, that does that, that has that. <laughs> That'd yeah. be cool. We put it on our, we put it on our law firm blog, but I don't know if anyone reads it, but um, like if, if Ripple is, if XRP is deemed to be a security, um, you have Ethereum, which arguably has more characteristics of a security than XRP. Mm -hmm. You have Ethereum, then going down and Tether doesn't count, USD coin. Uh, the Binance coin, uh, that had a straight ICO and is very centralized. That is as much of a security as XRP is, you know, arguably. Then you have XRP, Cardano, Solana. All of those coins would be deemed a security, I think, if XRP is. So yes, I mean, out of the top 10, you've got five of them that would in effect either have to change how they're doing things dramatically or register with the SEC. And that, that brings its own difficulties. So yes, it would be a dramatic effect if Ripple were to lose. You know, the thing that's happened up to this point is the SEC has really kind of been going after minnows to this point. There's been crypto lit litigation before. I mean, this is not the first you know, lawsuit that the SEC has brought against a crypto project. But this is really the first one where the defendant could really fight back. Um, and like you said, because they have the money. Ripple has like the dream team of SEC. I mean, they hired 
the former head of the SEC to be their defense lawyer. I think it's Mary Jo White is her name. They've hired former um, SEC lawyers to defend them. You know, Matt right. Solomon. So, you know, they really hired the best that's out there to defend them. And so if they lose, you know, then in theory, you're emboldening the SEC and all of these other projects are on the list. That's kind of crazy that they hired all these people who used to work at the SEC to represent them because they know exactly how the SEC works. And the fact that the SEC is not releasing those emails or whatever it is, um, I think that that's absolutely hilarious. And it's kind of this big, it's like a freaking circus, in my opinion, like from a vice, like from somebody who doesn't have a law degree, but somebody who is also uses critical thinking to kind of dissect everything that's happening. It's like, what what like what is what is even this like what is even happening but well you know with, with the sec though it's it's a little bit of a problem but i don't think if it's a problem that's fixable because it's so incestuous so your career path if you go to work at the sec is you go to work at the sec for five years you learn how the sec works and then you go leave and work for the big law firm and make three times as much money and you can't blame them for doing that right but it does I'm really incestuous because why are they hiring you? They're hiring you because you know how the SEC thinks. You still have friends that work at the SEC. So I think it was BlockFi. Remember, they made that settlement uh, a couple months ago. It was $100 million. They actually hired a former SEC lawyer. And the first thing he did when he got to BlockFi was worked out that settlement for them. So they hiring you because you know people over there and you know how they think. And you know, there's something about it that strikes me as wrong, but I don't know if there's a fix for that. I actually think that it's I, like the whole BlockFi thing. I think it was really stupid. I don't think the SEC or I don't think any government entity has any business finding any crypto company at this point, even though, you know, there's been some shady practices. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because they don't have clear regulations set into place. That's my, ol that's my only argument against it. I'm not saying that they're good. I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm just look like, what can they go by? You should go to law school because that's Ripple's big defense. It's called the fair notice defense. And that's basically what it says is you did not give us clear rules. We didn't even know that what we were doing is wrong. And under the U.S. Constitution, you can't break a law without knowing that what you're doing is wrong. And so that's really one of the big defenses that we're keeping an eye on. It's called the fair notice defense. It's under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. I, I could be wrong on that. But it's basically something that says if you do something wrong and you're you're prosecuted for it, you should know that you're doing something wrong. And their whole position for the last eight years has been, we didn't know we were doing anything wrong. In fact, they met with the SEC on many occasions before this lawsuit was filed. That part. And no one ever told them, you are doing something wrong, you're selling a security. And other companies met with them too and did the same thing. And none of those companies were ever told, don't sell XRP, it's a security. So that's one of the big defenses that Ripple has going on outside of just the you know argument that it's not a security. So anyway, point that. being, go to law school. I, I actually wanted to be an attorney when I was a kid. I wanted to be either an attorney or an archaeologist. We'll talk about that at another time. <laughs> It's a little just, different. Okay. It is, but it's, you know, it's very, it's both very exciting professions in my opinion, but in closing, in closing, what do you think the outcome is going to be? So 95% of SEC cases settle at some point. Right. Right. Just the, statistically, that's just the, the way it is. And most cases lot, do mo most cases do settle in general because it is very expensive to go to court and it's just a better option because you're not clogging up the court system. And it's just a better option to be like, you know what, I'm going to sue you for one hundred thousand dollars. Oh, you don't have one hundred thousand dollars. OK, I'll take 50. Exactly. And that's that's why most of them do settle. Exactly right. And I've talked to the, the uh, owners of projects that settled just for that reason. There's like, Jeremy, I didn't have ten million dollars to fight fight the case. And so what was I going to do? I gave back the $2 million worth of tokens that we had. So that absolutely happens. Now, Ripple's a little bit different. So it could be in that 5% because Ripple has the money to fight and they put up a pretty strong fight to this point and things are looking pretty strong for them as we enter, you know, into the last inning of the game here. So this is the type of case that could go all the way. I still think if, if you said I had to bet money on it, that this case is going to settle. And there's one, one major reason why I believe that. Ripple wants to uh, do an IPO and they've said that publicly and they've said as soon as this lawsuit is over, they're gonna do an IPO. Now, if they're gonna do an IPO, what do they have to do? They have to register with the SEC anyway, right? right? right. I mean, that's the, that's the whole purpose of it. They could become a publicly traded company. Now, if you were to tell me that they weren't gonna IPO, I would be like, well, maybe they're gonna take it all the way to the end. But if they have to register anyway, this just becomes a matter of money. Um, you could argue that 
you know, whether XRP is a security or not is going to be an issue. And they might move forward on that issue alone, but it doesn't make any sense to me if it's just a matter of money to not work out a number with the SEC where the SEC can claim victory and say, look, we got $100 million from them and they admitted that they did some things wrong five years ago and then clear the way for their IPO because they're gonna have to register anyway. So this is not an issue of they don't wanna register with the SEC. It's just really become an issue of money for me. And that issue is much easier to resolve in litigation than other issues like registration and, and those type of things. All right, I have to, I'm gonna actually have, I'm gonna have to have you back on in a month so I can process everything you said because I know that they are gonna settle in my personal opinion. And I've also heard that XRP or Ripple, um, they do want to move their operations out of the United States completely if, you know, the, if this doesn't end in their favor. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. But I just want to, like, I just want some sort of regulatory clarity for our industry. I really, really do. Because even with taxes, it's a, it's a pain in the butt paying taxes because it's like, I, I'm working with my CP for 2021 taxes and I'm like... Like we're just trying to, they're a great firm, amazing, but it's just so complicated. They make it so hard. And it's like, it's just not, the, the laws we have in place are not complementary to what we're trying to do. And for people that are trying to do the right thing. So, you know, for, for me, cause I, I represent a couple small projects and it's heartbreaking because I'm proud to be an American. It was just 4th of July, right? Yeah. I was out there, you know, I did the pledge. We, I was at a soccer game and they did the fireworks. It was great. And I'm, I'm very proud of my country. But when someone comes to me and says, Jeremy, we got this crypto project, blah, 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 blah. I say to them, have you thought about Dubai? Have you thought about Switzerland? And it's heartbreaking to do that. But these people want to be able to sleep at night and just work on their project, not thinking that they're going to get sued tomorrow and lose everything. And I can't guarantee, and no one can guarantee them here in the United States of America that that's not possible, that they could get sued tomorrow. And so I tell them to go abroad. And that's what I do with 90% of the people I talk to. And it's, it makes me sad. It makes me sad too, because it just, it's just not a good thing, but thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming on. And you guys basically in short, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, you're hoping to see some sort of settlement happen between December or March, um, of 2023 with between the SEC and Ripple. And then once we get some sort of clarity with that, then do you think we could see some more, um, do, you, do you think we could see like crypto regulation come into full force by that time? Or do you think it's gonna take a lot longer? So December to March timeframe would be a judicial resolution. That would okay, be the judicial. judge. Decision. So a settlement would be anytime between now and I would say November 15, because that's when the summary judgment briefs are due. So. Look for a settlement anytime between now and the end of November. And then if it doesn't happen, then I think it's going to go all the way. And that would be December to March. Um, the new legislation that was proposed, I've read, and I'm not a legislative expert, but it's basically not going to happen this year. They might regulate stable coins this year, oh, yeah, but sure. look for legislation sometime after the, uh, we have the midterm elections. That's why it's not going to happen this year. Ah, okay. So it would be next year if we get legislation. So basically, you guys, in short, what that means is the ivory towers just kind of want to play and they're playing this little like game of, I guess, Uno, and um, they're wasting your time because they have to see who's going to win Uno um, for re-election and they just don't care and they just care about themselves. That's all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you <got it>. Jerry, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. If you guys want to learn more about law. If you want to educate yourself, if you have a, if you're looking to hire somebody um, for maybe a startup or for a crypto project or for any type of legal needs, I highly recommend you do contact Jeremy. He is one of the probably only, only crypto returnees that I have had on the show. I do not have on retainer. I've got about six firms on retainer at this point. <laughs> I have to send All Jeremy right. some XRP just in case to get him on, get him on board, but also go subscribe to his YouTube and watch his stuff will be down below. Thank you so much for coming on Jeremy. Thanks, Wendy. Appreciate it.